In the last video in this series, we implemented our ALU and tested it, along with the A and B registers, with Course Prime's in-system sources and probes IP. We used the in-system sources and probes editor built into Course Prime's IDE to control and display our registers, the WBUS and the ALU. Depending on how familiar you are with Cordis Prime, you may or may not know that Cordis Prime provides you with a command line executable for each step of the FPGA design flow. The command line executables are completely interchangeable with the Cordis Prime GUI. You can use scripts to control the Cordis Prime software and to perform a wide range of functions such as compiling a design or scripting common tasks. TCL, pronounced tickle, stands for Tool Command Language, and it's the industry standard scripting language. Tickle supports control structures, variables, network socket access, and APIs. By combining Tickle commands and Cordis Prime API functions, you can create your own procedures and automate your design flow. Cordis Prime software supports Tickle version 8.5, which is supplied by the Tickle Developer Exchange. Cordis Prime software groups Tickle commands into packages by function. I'm going to talk about the JTAG and the in-system source pro packages in this video. Instead of using Cordis Prime GUI to display the sources and probes in our design, I'll show you how you can access the sources and probes via the command line. Note that it's also possible to interface to Xilinx Vivado and control the Vivado tools with tickle commands similar to how we're going to do it in Cordis. However, the first thing I want to do is to make some minor changes to our project files from the last video. You can see here that I'm in our top level Verilog file called SAP LU top. We created four instances of the in system source and probe IP and named them VIO WBUS, VIO control, VIO AREG, and VIO BREG. These instances are automatically assigned an instance ID in the order of creation when compiled by Cordis Prime. If you look at the virtual IO 8 bit module, as shown here, you can see that there is something called the instance ID, which is a parameter of the alt source probe top module. Here it is set to the string none. If we look at the alt source probe top module, you can see that the instance ID is the optional name for the particular instance of the in system source probe IP. It'd be nice if we could set the instance ID to a descriptive name. You'll see why we'd want to do this here in a few minutes. Returning to the virtual IO 8 bit module, we'll add a parameter called name to this module. Now the parameter name can be supplied to the instance ID parameter of the alt source probe top module. Back in our SAP ALU top module, we can set the name parameter for each instance of virtual IO 8 bit. You can only supply four characters for the naming of these instances. Here I'm setting the first instance to the name WBUS, the second instance to the name CNTL for control, and the third instance to the name AREG, and finally the fourth instance to the name BREG to correspond to what these instances are connected to within our design. Now I'm going to compile the design. Once the design has compiled successfully, I'll program the FPGA. If you're using Quartus on Windows, you can open up a Windows PowerShell terminal. If using Linux, you you can open a bash terminal session. To be able to access the in-system source probe package, you have to use the Cordis underscore STP executable. If we type Cordis underscore STP and hit enter, you can see that we get the usage information for this executable. What we're interested in for this video is the dash S flag, which tells the executable to run in an interactive tickle shell. So if we enter Cordis underscore STP dash S, we are presented with a message saying that we're in the Cordis prime shell and we're given a tickle prompt. If we type help and hit enter, we're shown the available packages that we have access to. The two packages we are interested in is the in-system source probe package and the JTAG package. You can also see that these packages are already loaded for us. I can get help on the in-system source probe package by typing help 
in system underscore source underscore probe. It shows the tickle commands that are available from the in system source probe package. Let's get some help on the JTAG package. You can see all the tickle commands that are available. We're interested in two commands, get device names and get hardware names. We'll start by entering the command get hardware names. You can see that the get hardware names command has returned the hardware name of the USB blaster interface on the FPGA development board I'm using. The command actually returns a list of hardware names, with the list being denoted by the curly brackets. Since there's only one USB blaster on the FPGA development board, the command returns a one item list. This list contains one item. Actually, we want to save this list into a variable called HW so that we can refer to it later since our other commands will require a hardware name as an input variable. We set the variable HW for hardware to the result of the command get hardware names, which is a list of the hardware names the command finds. The next thing we need to do is to get the device names of the devices that appear on the USB blaster. There can be multiple JTAG devices, so we need to use the correct device name. If we enter the command get device names, you can see that we're given the usage info for this command. We haven't supplied the hardware name that this command requires. So we enter the command get device names and specify the hardware name like this. Remember the variable HW is a list of hardware names. In this case, there's only one item in this list, the USB blaster. To pass this name to the get device names command, I use the lindex command and specify an index of zero, which is the first item in the list of hardware names. You can see that this command returns a list of names, in this case, a single item list, which is the JTAG device on the FPGA development board I'm using. Just like the hardware names, we should save the device list to a variable. Here we'll call it DN for device name. Now that we have a list of hardware and device names, we can move on to working with the in system source probe package tickle commands. We can get help on this by typing help in system underscore source underscore probe. The first thing we should do is get a list of the in system source probe instances in our design. We created four instances of the in system source probe. IP in our project. We'll use the get in system source probe instance info command to get our list of instances. Hopefully it'll show us that we have four instances in our design. You can see that this command wants both a device name and a hardware name. Since both our hardware names list saved in the variable HW and device names list saved in the variable DN have only one item in both lists, we'll access those names by specifying an index of zero for both. Here we save the list of instance info to the variable INST for instances. Now you can see why I wanted to be able to name the instances of the in-system source probe IP. The names are returned that correspond exactly to the names provided as parameters to our instances in our Verilog file. The command returns a list of lists, actually. Each instance is represented by a list which contains an index as the first item, the width of the source probe in bits in the second item, the width of the probe port in bits in the third item, and the four character name of the instance in the fourth item in the list. I can iterate over this list and display each instance's info on separate lines as you see here. To be able to read and write our sources and probes ports in our design, we first need to enter the command start in system source probe and pass the hardware name and the device name to the command. To read the probe data, we use the command read probe data. Here you can see the various parameters of this command. We have to supply an instance index that corresponds to one of the four source probe instances in our design. From the get in system source probe instance info, command, we know that the instance index of our WBUS probe is zero. If we issue the read probe command with an instance index of zero, we get an 8-bit string of binary back from the command. We can get this value in hexadecimal by adding the value in hex flag to the command. Here you can see that it's returned FF hex, which is correct since nothing is driving the W bus, so it is at a high impedance. If we read the control probe port, which is index 1, we get the value 1 hex back. 
If you remember, the control probe port is connected to our zero and carry flags. So if we read it in binary, we see that the zeroth bit, which is the Z flag, is set, and the first bit, which is the carry flag, is not set. The Z flag is set because both the A and B registers currently contain zero. If we read the A and B register probes, which are index 2 and index 3 respectively, we see that both contain zero hex. Now let's see how to write our source data. The command is write source data. You can see that the command requires an instance index and a value to be supplied. If we write 42 hex to our wval in source port, which is at index 0, wval in is set to 42 hex. We can't see that directly until we drive that value onto the w bus, but there is a command to read the source port data back. Read source data returns 42 hex, which is what we wrote to index 0, which is our wval in source port. To drive hex 42 onto the w bus, we need to assert the w enable control line. Index 1 is the control instance, and its source Source port is connected to the 8-bit control wire in our design. Bit 0 of our control is our W enable signal. So if I write a binary string of 0000 0001 to index 1, you can see that the W bus is now being driven with the value of 42 hex. To transfer 42 hex into our A register, I need to assert the A latch line in the A reg instance, which is instance index 2. To latch 42 hex into the A register, I need to pulse the clock, which I do by toggling the clock bit, which is bit 4 in our control register. You can see that the A register now contains 42 hex. Now I'll set our control lines, W enable, clock pulse, and A latch back to zeros. If I assert the A enable control line, you can see that the A register drives the value 42 hex onto the W bus. I'll reset the A enable line, and you can see that the W bus goes back to high impedance indicated by FF hex here. Being able to access the Quartus in system source and probe IP through tickle commands allows us to write a simple script which we can directly write, for example, the A register in our design. It actually works the same way for all the registers in our design. Since I only have one USB blaster on my FPGA board and one JTAG device, I can just write a tickle command that connects to the FPGA board with these default values. If I type connect, the in-system source probe instances are found and we're ready to talk to the design in the FPGA. I have a command called WAH, which means write the A register in hexadecimal. If I write 42 hex to the A register, you see that the A register is updated on the board. I can write various values to the A register, and you can see that the FPGA board's A register display updates accordingly. This makes it easier to debug our design without having to worry about the exact sequence of setting values to each source port to accomplish the A register write. I'll be using this program in future videos as we further implement the 8-bit computer in the FPGA. I mentioned earlier that Xilinx Vivado has a similar tickle scripting capability. If we open a terminal and type vivado-mode TCL, we get an interactive tickle shell. We can type help to get more information on various categories. If I type help-category debug, you see that we get a list of tickle commands applicable to the debug category. This is very similar to Quartus, except that Vivado integrates all the tickle capability under one executable, where in Quartus there are different executables that have access to various packages of functionality. For example, the in-system source probe and JTAG tickle commands are only available from running the Quartus underscore STP or Quartus underscore STP underscore TCL executables. The main point is that you can access your in-system sources and probes in the Quartus case and the virtual input output of VIO in the Vivado case using tickle commands instead of the GUI in both tools. Quartus even includes TK, which is a cross-platform widget toolkit that allows you to write your own GUIs that interface to the Quartus executables. You can imagine making a control panel with TK that displays the registers in the CPU in a nice GUI. 
Well, that's it for this video. In the next video, we'll continue the implementation of our 8-bit computer by adding the output register to our design and connecting it up to real-world outputs. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.